The Bible gives us answers to the big questions of life, such as, how did the world begin? Why are there troubles in this world? Is this all there is, or is there life after death? Hi, I'm Yvonne Prynne with Bible 805, where you learn to know, trust, and apply the Bible. God hasn't left us alone to answer these questions, and many more that trouble us in our quiet moments and worst nightmares, as we'll learn in our lesson today entitled Genesis and Job, Answers to the Big Questions of Life, Part 1. Why are we here? What went wrong? And is this all there is? The beginning of the Bible is literally the beginning. In the beginning, God, Genesis 1-1 tells us, before all else, we're introduced to the protagonist of the story, God. From beginning to end, it is His story. The story begins with God creating a parenthesis in eternity to carefully craft a world. He then fills this world with living creatures and ultimately with one created in His image, mankind, male and female, to whom He assigns fulfilling work and with whom He will walk in a perfect world. But an enemy was also there, Satan, the antagonist. Almost immediately he enters the scene. And God's beloved creation turns against him, believes Satan's lie, and that sets up the plot, the storyline of the rest of the Bible. Before we move on with the plot, the storyline that we're going to be talking about as we go through the whole thing, I want to acknowledge that much has been written about the details of creation. If those details are important to you, there are many resources online where you can check them out, but we won't be talking about them for this study because our emphasis is not so much about the when and the how of creation, but about the who. The God who created is the God who, as the story goes along, cares for, redeems, and ultimately will restore his people in creation. As I said, history is truly his story. And it's a long story, so let's get started. As you start reading through the Bible, you'll begin reading in Genesis, which is what most people expect when we start reading through the Bible. But then, after just three days, you jump into Job. Now, what is going on, you might ask? In most Bibles, the book of Job is close to the middle of the Bible, just before Psalms. However, in most chronological Bible readings, Job is placed near the beginning of the book of Genesis. Now, this chronology is incredibly important because of simply making the Bible just a book of hopeful promises and unrelated Bible stories. When you read the Bible in chronological, historical order, you see how the events fit together why the prophets preached when they did, how prophecy is fulfilled, and the power of progressive revelation. You see for yourself how God is the one author of the one story of the Bible. Reading the Bible with any system is better than not reading it at all. But when you read it in chronological, historical order, you'll see the huge difference that it makes. Now please check out the foundational lessons on why this is important and why it's important to read it this way on Bible 805, www.bible805.com. I have a series of lessons on why we should read our Bible in chronological order, why people don't do that, why our Bibles aren't in chronological order. I also have a free ebook that you can download that summarizes all those things, but if you need some more background on it, and I do recommend that you take time to look at it, please go to Bible805.com where you can download that. Now, next I'm going to give you some additional reasons why Genesis and Job should be read together. Genesis and Job, first of all, have one author, Moses. Now, however, in both cases, we need to think of Moses as more of an editor 
than what we would normally think of as an author. An author creates the content, but in Genesis and Job, the words are not originally his. The content, of course, was revealed from God. Plus, Moses probably had access to oral and written records of what happened prior to his life. Now, just for a little bit of additional information on how various oral records helped um, the creators of the Bible and just the different uh, things that were passed down to them, I do have a chart on the lengthy lifespans of early biblical characters that go along with your notes on this lesson. So please go to the website, again, www.bible805.com, and you can download that for free. Now let's look at the traditional, geographical, and historical details that also affirm Moses as the author. For those of you watching the video, here is a picture of the timeline of the Old Testament patriarchs and how you can use it to verify how we got the Old Testament. I have a whole lesson on that. Again, that is you can link to it from the Bible 805 website. Now, the traditional witness of Moses' authorship is contested by some contemporary anti-supernaturalist views. They believe that Moses was not the author and that Job is simply a fictional, allegorical story by some unnamed author. Though there's no evidence for that anywhere. We have no idea who this unnamed author is or when it was written or whatever. But traditional the traditional view of it is just rejected out of hand by some of these um, some contemporary critics however thousands of years of history and tradition hold the view that Moses was the author and the quote that I'm going to read to you is just an excellent summary of it where it says uniform Jewish tradition ascribed the book of Job to Moses and also accepted it as part of the true canon of scripture this description seems quite reasonable if Moses is regarded as the editor. Moses most likely came into possession of Job's record during his 40-year exile from Egypt in the land of Midian, and this was not far from Job's own homeland in Uz, and quickly recognized its great importance. It was probably similar to how he compiled and organized the primeval, or that means relating to the earliest ages, records from which he's also given us the book of Genesis. That being the case, the book of Job is probably the oldest book in the Bible. It contains more references to creation, the flood, and other primeval events than any other book except Genesis and provides more insight into the age-long conflict between God and Satan than almost any other book. And I believe that this statement is totally true. I, I did a lot of research in various areas and uh, think that this, this quote from IRC, icr.org is really one of the best summaries of it. Just as later books in the Bible refer to other accounts of contemporary history being written, for example, in Kings and Chronicles, it'll talk about, um, you know, uh, so-and-so also wrote the books of Jashur, or these events were also recorded in the annals of the Kings, and different things like that. And since we have earliest, since we have ancient writings from really early sources, the Gilgamesh epic is one. If you're looking at the video, here is a picture of one of the cuneiform tablets of, of that. Um, Moses also had access to all of the historical writings that were available in Egypt and all of the different things about the early days of the earth and he would have naturally had access to and read all of them when he fled to Midian and I'm sure afterwards. Following are some additional evidence of Moses as the author of the book of Job and an early date also for its content. Now the just geographical evidence for Moses authorship if you look at a map and also consulting biblical archaeology, these sources place us, where the book takes place, the book of Job, near Midian, where Moses spent 40 years after he fled from Egypt. Now, 
it was not an accident that God sent Moses to the specific place where he would have heard the oral history of Job and perhaps even had access to written documents of Job's story. Now, some historical evidence, too, on the dating of the book that shows that it wasn't written really, really late after the Babylonian captivity and and all those sort of silly um, things that people say really without evidence. Because in the book itself, for Moses to be the author, the book needs to take place prior to the time of the Exodus. In other words, during the time of the patriarchs. And that's what the book shows through the historical details of internal evidence because it describes a time that was, first of all, similar to the patriarchal society described elsewhere in the Bible. It was very much a nomadic lifestyle of living in tents, wealth measured in herds of various kinds. It was also pre-law, as evidenced by Job's personal sacrifices for his family. If they sinned, It was a time without a formal priesthood or temple structure. That was not referred to in any way, so it had to be prior to that. Also, it was a time without any overall strong central government. None is mentioned or alluded to in any way. Once again, all of these things very similar to the time of the patriarchs. Our overall picture of Job is similar to what we would picture the world of Abraham, and it would be consistent with the world presented in the accounts of both their lives. Now, one more thing. Reading Job out of historical context or reading it as part of the poetical books has a very dangerous potential result in that for people, not just for biblical critics, but just casual readers, it's without thinking. People can just make Job into some fictional character who represents unjust suffering. That is not how the Bible presents Job. And to think of him in that way robs the book of much of its power. Now here's how the Bible confirms Job as a real individual. The Old Testament biblical confirmation that he was a real person is found in Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a priest and an exile from Israel who was deported from Israel to Babylon prior to the fall of Jerusalem. Now, in a passage where God is giving him a message about the coming judgment, this is what Ezekiel writes. He says, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they could only save themselves by their righteousness, declares the Sovereign Lord. Now, God speaks... And Ezekiel repeats his words with a clear sense that these three are real persons because, first of all, Daniel was his contemporary. He was a fellow exile to Babylon. Now, does not only does Noah, excuse me, not only does Ezekiel consider Noah a real person, but the historical reality of Noah is verified by Jesus when he used him to illustrate how the world would be prior to his second coming in Matthew 24, 37, and 38. Ezekiel places Job as a real individual alongside these other two, clearly taking him out of the realm of a fictional character. The New Testament also confirms that Job was a real person. In James 5.11, it says, As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. James cites Job in a way that assumes he's talking about a real person. His assertion here would not have any meaning if Job was simply a Jewish folktale written by some unknown person. In addition to this specific example, please note, the Bible is the best commentary on itself. Because of that, we should expect that the various parts of the Bible agree with and comment on each other as these varied varied passages of Job do. Now a summary and review of what we know about Job so far. Based on tradition, biblical confirmation, and the historical and geographical evidence we have, we will read Job believing that he was a real person who lived about the time of the patriarchs, What took place in the book were true events experienced by Job. 
that the finished book was supernaturally revealed to and perhaps using other records and it was recorded in its final form by Moses. For us, it follows then that Job, as with all the Bible, was given to us by inspiration from God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us do what is right. That is why we can use the books of Job and Genesis to answer the big foundational questions of life. And so what are the big foundational questions of life that I'm referring to? Number one, how did we get here? Two, what went wrong? And a sub-question of that is, who is Satan and what power does he have? Three, is there life after death? Four, what about people who have never heard of Jesus? Five, why do innocent people suffer? And number six, how can we help people who are suffering? We're going to cover the first three in this lesson, and then in the next lesson, we'll cover the next three. In this lesson, we'll primarily look at how Job answers these questions with some references to Genesis. We'll talk more about the people and stories of Genesis in our other lesson. First of all, an overview of Job. The book opens with Job being described as God's ideal man. Satan appears before God and challenges God that Job only serves him because God blesses him. To see if that's true, God allows Satan to harm Job, and he loses his wealth, his family, and finally his health. Three friends and a fourth later come to comfort Job, but instead they accuse and repeat false beliefs about God. Job consistently defends himself and demands a defense before God. God responds and shows his power. And it's important to note that God never answers Job's questions. Job repents and he's restored. Now question number one, how did we get here? That's answered in both books. In the beginning God is how Genesis starts and Genesis continues with a record of God's creation of all things. God as creator is confirmed in Job when God confronts him and begins by establishing who he is. He's God on the basis of his creation when he says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Do you know how its dimensions were determined? And who did the surveying? What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. This reality that God created us is a foundation for his claims on us. It's also the answer for meaning and fulfillment in life. The rest of the Bible affirms God's creation again and again. For example, in Psalm 103 where it says, He made us. In Acts 17.28 where it says, In him we live and move and have our being. There is no such thing as a self-made man or woman. Humanity is not the result of time plus chance. We are created by a loving God who knows what is best for us and designed our lives for meaning and purpose. We sometimes trivialize the description of the Bible as we just call it the owner's manual and for the best functioning of life we tell people to read the directions. But that's really a true statement. It is our instruction manual for our lives to function best. We really do need to read the directions in the Bible. C.S. Lewis put it this way, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. Question number two, what went wrong? Genesis tells us that part of the story, and Job expands on it. In Genesis 3, an antagonist enters the story, Satan. He's first introduced as a serpent. God gave humanity only one negative command. He said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the antagonist, Satan, created doubt about God's goodness and offered an alternative to trusting God. He offered humanity wisdom rather than relationship. 
And Genesis tells us that Adam and Eve chose the alternative to the relationship with God. They chose what Satan offered, and we call this action the fall. Now, in the storyline of the Bible, the fall is a conflict that initiates all the following actions of the Bible. Everything changes with this event. Immediately after the fall, God promises a Savior, and though we don't know the entire story at this time, the actions of that promised Savior would reverse paradise lost with paradise regained. But that's a long time from now. And as we start this story, let's look more closely at the antagonist, at Satan, so we can understand his tactics better, because unfortunately, he's part of many Bible stories and of our stories also. Now, other scriptures that will help us understand Satan a little bit more fully, let me share some of these with you. First of all, he was the highest of created beings, an angel, who once held a place of honor before God, but he rebelled and he was removed from his place. In Isaiah 14:12, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to earth, mighty though you were, against the nations of the world. Read Ezekiel 28 also for more pictures of his fall when you have time. We wish we knew more about his extraordinary backstory. What we do know is clothed in symbolic language, and there is much we do not know. But God has told us all we need to know. Satan's past does not concern us nearly as much as what he is doing now, and the book of Job gives us important insight into his current actions and limitations, and we need to keep these in mind as we read through the Bible and in our daily lives. Here's what Job shows us about Satan. Satan has access to God. He's allowed to initiate natural disasters, crime and death, and sickness. All of these things he did to Job. Nowhere in the Bible, though, are we given specifics about his ability or the scope or how he does them, if or when he does them today. We don't know. But we do know that when and if these things happen, they're all under God's control and limitations. Not only do we see this in Job, but also in the New Testament again and again. Just one example is when Jesus stills the storm with his words in Matthew eight twenty three through 27 Now a little bit more about how Satan's power is limited. Clearly in Job, Satan is subordinate to God. There is no dualism in the Bible. God and Satan are not two equal powers engaged in a cosmic battle. Satan is God's creation. He is not eternal. He is not all-powerful. He is not all-knowing. He cannot read your thoughts. He cannot know the future for certain. He is also not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at one time, though he has legions of demonic powers. In Job 1, Satan appears before God in an obvious place of submission. God questions him, limits him. We see this as a foundational lesson in Job. This, is a, this assurance is also repeated in the New Testament, where in 1 John 4.4 4 it says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, Satan and his influence, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Though limited, Satan can still cause a lot of trouble. Satan is not at all original in his strategies. What he used to tempt Adam and Eve, he continues to use today. That simple statement in Genesis 3.1. Did God really say? Satan continues to use that again and again and again. He always begins with questioning if God really said something. And then it progresses to suggesting an alternative that sounds good but is ultimately destructive. To stand up against that, you need to know what God's Word truly says, what He truly wants you to do. And it is only through God's Word that you will know for certain what God wants, because our world, our culture, our values today seem so pleasing in many ways, just as the fruit did to Eve, but they're ultimately destructive. Additionally, 
what we see about Satan in the book of Job. Satan is restless. He wanders the earth and he's an accuser of God's people, both then and now. In Job 1 7, it says, The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. In the New Testament, we see this hasn't changed. In 1 Peter 5 8, it tells us, Be careful. Watch out for attacks from Satan, your great enemy. He prowls around like a hungry, roaring lion looking for some victim to tear apart. In that wandering, Satan accuses God's people. When God points out the blameless life of Job, Satan responds, Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan will twist every good thing in our lives and the lives of others into something evil. That chatter in your head, constantly telling you what a mess you are, is seldom from God. God's voice of conviction gives you a way to do better. Satan simply wants to pound you. Don't listen to him. Evaluate your life in light of God's word. Confess your sin if necessary and press ahead, assured of God's love and forgiveness. Also, this is why slander, gossip, thinking evil of our brothers and sisters, of anyone, is so wrong. We're listening to Satan. We're doing Satan's work when we shouldn't be doing that. We never know what is truly going on in another's life. Grant them the grace you receive from God and that you want for yourself. Don't gossip. Grant grace. Don't accuse people. Pray for them. Satan's interference with people is significant, but it will not last forever. We are reminded in Ephesians 6.12, For we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against persons without bodies, the evil rulers of the unseen world, whose mighty sa- those mighty satanic beings and great evil princes of darkness who rule this world, and against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the spirit world. Jesus rose from the dead, and Satan's interference with God's people will also someday come to an end, and Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. The accusing chatter in our minds will cease. The interference in our lives and our world will be over. In Revelation 12.10, it encourages us with these words, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. Hopeful words, but who will be around to see that? And here we get to question number three. Is there life after death? The answer is incredibly important to understand because, as the Apostle Paul tells us, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Of the many big questions of life that Job answers, the question of is there life after death is definitely the most important because it literally puts all else that happens to us in proper perspective. If there's no life after death, no salvation from the punishment of death, there's no point to the rest of the Bible. But there is salvation from death. There is a Savior who will conquer death, and the effects of his victory will reach back to the earliest days of humanity. Our God is an eternal God, and he did not create throwaway creatures. Job affirms this truth. Job provides an early and definitive answer to this question. In Job 14, 14 and 15, he affirms the physical bodily resurrection. I'm going to read it to you, and then we'll take a closer look at some of the Hebrew words in it that amplify the meaning. And the passage says, If someone dies, will they live again? All the days of my hard service I will wait for my renewal to come. You will call, and I will answer you. You will long for the creature your hands have made. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. A few notes on this back in verse 14 where it says I wait for my renewal to come that word renewal is the Hebrew word chalifa 
which is similar to what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he talks about his earthly tent being exchanged for the heavenly one. Chalifa means a change of garments, a renewal. So he knew about this renewal that would come. But then the one that's really, really neat is in 26 and 27 where it says, After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Both of those words, my skin and my flesh, are the Hebrew words basar. They are exactly the same word in the Hebrew. You see, what he's saying is just my skin, my body itself, it's going to be destroyed, but I will have a new one. In my flesh, I will see God. Resurrection to the Christian is tangible. It's solid. It's a renewal into the tangible, solid, fleshly individual that we were created to be. Even early in his struggles, Job knew this. The passage we just discussed, Job knew that his earthly pain was not all there was to his story. And there are sadly many, including some in the church and some who teach the Bible that I've heard say, well, in the Old Testament, there was no clear belief of life after death. And that is simply not true, as this passage in Job and many others show. I also have a complete lesson on this. Is there life after death? It's on the www.bible805.com site. And I go through numerous Old Testament passages that affirm the truth of life after death. Plus, I have a shorter lesson on the critiques that the critics and some of the critiques that deny it, which, and I show you how it's just goofy why they do. So please do see the podcasts, the videos, the printed materials on this again at www.bible805.com. Now, one more hopeful reminder. As one writer said, if we truly believe in the promised joy of a fulfilling, meaningful eternity spent with those we love and a God who loves us, even the most horrible experiences of life will seem like one night spent in a bad hotel. Now, the reality is you might be in that horrid, bad hotel now. But be assured that as the book of Job shows us and the rest of the Bible affirms, joy will come. Perhaps not in this life, but it will come and it will last forever. So what's next? I pray that what we've covered today are comforting truths to those who know Jesus. Yet I also realize that the answers to these questions sometimes bring up additional questions. And we're going to cover the some additional questions and their answers in our next lesson, Genesis and Job, Answers to the Big Questions of Life, Part 2. We're going to look at what about people who've never heard of Jesus? Why do innocent people suffer? And how can we help those who are suffering? Join me as I lay a solid foundation for studying the remainder of the Bible because the big questions covered in this lesson and the next will come up again and again. And until then, be encouraged with these final words from Job where remember he said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed yet in my flesh I will see God. That's all for now. For notes on this lesson, related resources, and helpful links, please go to www.bible805.com. And please do tell your friends and just you know, people in your church, whoever, about these lessons. They can look at them freely, and I really encourage you to encourage them to go through the Bible as a whole. Their lives will be changed because of it. In closing, I'm Yvonne Pratt, your fellow pilgrim, writer, and teacher for Jesus, and I'd like to end with this benediction. May you know the invitation of God to move from confusion to clarity, from wandering to rest, from loneliness to knowing you are loved, from turmoil to peace, from wherever you are on your spiritual journey to a growing knowledge of God's Word and in your personal relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 